little fox. The first Thanksgiving. Hi, I'm Mary Chilton, and I am one of the original pilgrims who survived a year of famine to celebrate the first Thanksgiving in the New World. After arriving in the New World, the first thing we needed to do was to write a document that would guide our new society. The men gathered together and wrote the Mayflower Compact. Every man who had traveled aboard the Mayflower signed the agreement on November twenty-first, sixteen twenty. Soon after the Mayflower Compact was signed, the men went exploring to find a place where we could build our new homes. After several days, they returned to the Mayflower with some corn they had found. We think we will find a place to settle soon, they told us hopefully. We were relieved. Oh, thank the Lord. We said. After six more weeks of exploration, our men sent word that they had found a place to settle. December thirty-first, sixteen twenty, was our first chance to see the place we would call home. We named it Plymouth. The weather in January was bad, but the men worked hard to cut logs for the settlement. First, they built a common house to store our tools, furnishings, and supplies. Then they built houses. The work went slowly because many people were ill, and more than half died in the great sickness that winter. My family was one of the hardest hit. I lost both my father and my mother. My father was the oldest pilgrim to make the voyage to the New World, and he died very quickly. My mother was a very strong woman, but she also died. I know in my heart that she died because she wanted me to live. She always made sure I ate first. She would give me some of her food because there wasn't really enough food for all of us to eat. By the end of the winter, more than half of those who had crossed on the Mayflower had died, but the older women were the hardest hit. Only five of the eighteen original married women aboard the Mayflower survived. Although I was now an orphan with no mother or father, the other pilgrims took me in and treated me with kindness. With so many women dead, I found myself busier than ever. I had to help do the cooking and the laundry for the men and boys who had lost their wives and mothers. In March of 1621, a Native American came to our village. His name was Samoset. He walked into the village shouting, "Welcome, welcome, Englishmen!" Even though it was a very cold and windy day. Samoset was naked except for a cloth around his waist and moccasins on his feet. The men talked to Samoset for a long time. Samoset left the next day after promising to return soon. After several days, Samoset did return with another Native American who amazed us all with his flawless English. His name was Squanto, and he said he was the last surviving member of the Patuxet tribe. Squanto stayed with us that whole spring and summer. He taught our men how to hunt and how to fish. He taught the women how to plant and cultivate corn, squash, and beans. Squanto helped us to make friends with the neighboring tribes. With his help, we signed a peace treaty with King Massasoit. We learned that our seeds from England did not grow very well in the New World, but Squanto showed us that if we planted our seeds with herring, then they would grow. Squanto and other Native Americans also helped us with our crops. With their help, our corn, squash, and beans did very well that year. To celebrate our bountiful harvest, we invited the great King Massasoit and his advisors to our village. The feast lasted for three days. We ate duck, turkey, deer, clams, lobster, and many kinds of fish. There were lots of berries, nuts, and several kinds of fruit. But the best dish of all was an Indian pudding made from pumpkin and sweetened with the syrup from a maple tree. We thank God for the success of our harvest and for the kindness of the Native Americans, who taught us the skills we needed to survive. The Carter Family, Episode Sixty-Five: Thanksgiving Dinner. The Carters were eating Thanksgiving dinner. 
I love cranberry sauce, Mom said. Too bad we only eat it at Thanksgiving. I like turkey, stuffing, and gravy, Dad said. We only have those at Thanksgiving, too. We eat mashed potatoes all the time, Harry said. But I still like them on Thanksgiving. Emmy and Oliver were too busy eating to talk. I cooked a special treat, Aunt Judy said. Who wants some oyster pie? Dad made a face. Oyster pie is an old family favorite, Aunt Judy said. But your dad is always afraid to try it. Oysters look weird, Dad said. The kids laughed. <laughs> Does oyster pie taste like pumpkin pie? Oliver asked. No, it's not a dessert, Aunt Judy said. But it still tastes good. Dad, you always make us try new foods, Emmy said. I'll try oyster pie, if you do. Everyone looked at Dad. You go first, Emmy, he said. Aunt Judy put some oyster pie on their plates. Emmy took a small bite. Then she took a bigger bite. Mm, this is good, she said. Dad took a bite and swallowed hard. I guess it's okay, he said. Okay, it's delicious, Emmy said. More oyster pie, please! Fun at Kids Central, Episode 67, Thankful Pumpkin Pies. My favorite Thanksgiving food is cranberry sauce, Izzy said. It was the day before Thanksgiving vacation. Everyone was excited about the holiday. I like sweet potatoes, Ethan said. Where's Bobby? Miss Shelley asked. Ethan shrugged. His mom picked him up early today. I think he had a doctor's appointment. Oh, Miss Shelley said. I didn't get to wish him a happy Thanksgiving. Did someone say Thanksgiving? Bobby hurried into the gym. He was carrying a plastic container and a basketball. Ethan said you left school early, Izzy said. I did, Bobby said. But I didn't want to miss Kids Central today. It's the last one before Thanksgiving vacation. Jason stared at him. You look different. Bobby grinned and started dribbling the basketball across the gym. He jumped up. Whoosh! The ball sailed through the hoop. Nina laughed. <laughs> I know it's different. Me too, Izzy said. You got your cast off, Bobby! Congratulations, Miss Shelley said. Thanks! Bobby picked up the plastic container. I made something to thank you guys. Huh? Jason said. What did we do? You made having a broken leg more fun, Bobby said. We did? Izzy asked. Bobby nodded. Missing soccer season was terrible. But you guys helped me, and we had fun. He opened the container. See? Thanksgiving cookies! They are shaped like turkeys. But don't worry, they taste like chocolate. They look delicious, Miss Shelley said. They'll go great with our activity today. What are we making? Jason asked. Thankful pumpkin pies, Miss Shelley said. 
Don't you mean Thanksgiving pumpkin pies? Izzy asked. Nope. Miss Shelley had a stack of paper plates, paint, markers, and pots of glitter. The kids gathered around the table. These pies aren't for eating, Miss Shelley explained. They're a fun way to share what you're thankful for. Oh, I get it. Nina read from the board. Step one, paint the inside circle of a paper plate orange. That's for the pie filling. Then, paint the outside edge tan for the pie crust. Step two, stick three cotton balls to the paint. Bobby laughed. <laughs> cool, that will look like whipped cream on top of the pumpkin filling. Step three, sprinkle with glitter to look like spices and sugar, Ethan said. Everyone painted their plates. Let's have Bobby's cookies while the paint dries, Miss Shelley said. Soon, Izzy ran to the pies. The paint's dry! Nina looked at the board. Step five, use letter stickers to spell, I'm thankful for, and then cut out a slice of pie with scissors. Step six, Jason read. Write five things you're thankful for. Easy, Ethan said. I'm thankful for Bobby's cookies. After everyone wrote their five things, Nina read the next step. Put the painted plate on top of the white plate. Connect them loosely with a brass paper fastener. Now spin, Izzy said. Everyone spun their plates. I want to show you guys what I'm thankful for, Bobby said. Slowly, he showed his five things. Izzy, Nina, Ethan, Jason, and Miss Shelley. Thank you, Bobby! His friend said. <laughs> Little Men, Chapter Twenty Four Happy Thanksgiving. That year, the children were especially proud of their contributions to Thanksgiving dinner. My herbs made the stuffing really delicious, Nan said with her mouth full. Jack scooped another potato onto his plate and said, These are the best potatoes I've ever eaten. Has everyone had some of my beans? Nat asked. Of course, Tommy said. You grew so many that Asia said we must all eat three helpings. <laughs> the pies came from my giant pumpkin, Rob said. And wait till you see. Hush, Daisy said, giving her cousin a gentle swat. It's a surprise. But the professor had overheard them and was curious. Daisy, I know you helped bake many pies, but Rob's pumpkin was enormous. What did you do with the rest of it? Well, uh... Daisy hesitated. Dan rescued Daisy by handing a bowl of nuts to Mr. Bauer. Sir, try these! The professor looked down at the table, murmuring to Joe. Everyone seems to be in on this secret except me, but I can't wait. After dinner, they all went for a long walk. Then they waited impatiently for the rest of the family to arrive. Mr. and Mrs. March, Aunt Meg and baby Josie, Uncle Lori and Aunt Amy, with Bess and a special guest. Mr. Hyde! Dan exclaimed, immediately recognizing the naturalist. What are you doing here? I thought he'd like to see how well you're doing, Lori said. We're so proud of you. What a fine, polite young man you've turned into, Mr. Hyde said to Dan. Dan and Mr. Hyde went to a parlor to talk until it was time for the evening's entertainment. 
Then everyone went into the schoolroom, where Jack amazed the audience by solving math problems in his head. Tommy won the spelling bee, and Dan performed gymnastics. Dan's a strong lad, Mr. Hyde said to the professor. When I go to South America in a few years, I'd like to take him along. Overhearing that remark, Dan smiled, grateful to both Mr. Hyde and the Bowers. Where did the other children go? The professor asked. Back here! said a muffled voice behind a curtain made of blankets. <laughs> said more voices amid lots of giggles. The curtain rose to reveal Bess as Cinderella. Dressed in a ragged pinafore, she sat before a cardboard fireplace, not moving until Daisy whispered loudly, Now! Oh, I wish I could go to the ball, Cinderella said. Lori clapped enthusiastically for his daughter, and Amy whispered, My little darling. You must not speak to me, scolded Cinderella, looking at her parents. The back of the fireplace opened like a door, and Nan appeared as the fairy godmother. Dressed in a red cloak and pointed hat, she struggled to get through the opening. You shall go to the ball, the fairy godmother said, tapping Cinderella with her wand. Now you must show my pretty dress, Cinderella said, tugging on her pinafore. No, no, Nan said in her own voice. First you say, how can I go in these rags? Oh, that's right, Cinderella said, and repeated Nan's words. With that, the fairy godmother unfastened Cinderella's pinafore to reveal a beautiful pink dress. She placed a crown on Cinderella's head and gave her silver paper slippers. But you have no coach, the fairy godmother declared, waving her wand. Cinderella was too busy admiring her slippers to say her next line, so Silas just leaped into action from backstage. Ready, Daisy? He whispered. Push! Suddenly, four rats appeared pulling a magnificent coach made from Rob's pumpkin and Teddy's wagon. As the coachman, Teddy helped Cinderella into the coach and squeezed in beside her. Cinderella waved to the audience, and that was the end of the first scene. In the ball scene, Rob played the prince, while Nan and Daisy were the stepsisters. The prince and Cinderella danced and danced, until finally, Nan had to whisper, Cinderella, drop your shoe! Oops, I forgot! gasped Cinderella, taking off a slipper and planting it in the middle of the stage before running away. <laughs> in the last scene, the prince and the coachman arrived with the slipper, which didn't fit the stepsisters, only Cinderella. I'm the princess! <laughs> Cinderella announced, running over to her parents. Didn't I do a good job? It was a beautiful play, Lori said. And now I know what happened to the pumpkin, the professor said with a smile. Following the play, Nat played a sweet song on his violin. When he finished, he bowed to Joe, saying, Mr. Lawrence wrote that piece for you. Oh, thank you, Lori, Joe said. You're the one who deserves thanks, Lori said. Look at what you've done for these children. Nat, Dan, and Nan, and the others, are all so much better and so full of promise. And after John died, you comforted the twins as if they were your own children. When Bess is old enough, I want her to go to Plumfield. Joe couldn't resist teasing him. I thought you were unsure about boys and girls at school together. Not anymore. And now you must excuse me for a moment. Lori said, slipping away. 
He soon returned with all the children, who formed a circle around Joe and the professor. Together they sang a Thanksgiving song, and at the end, the circle tightened into a hug. There was one plant that had taken root in all of Plumfield's gardens this year, and that was love.